Good afternoon, I'm Dr. B, and today the topic I'll be talking about is harm reduction. Now we'll get into it in detail in just a moment. Uh, please do join me in my vision to create a society where those dealing with substance abuse can live and prosper with dignity and hope. You can very easily do that by clicking the subscribe button below and pressing the ring bell to, I believe, to the left. Uh, so today uh, I've been asked to talk about harm reduction and there were certain some questions uh, asked of me uh, and I was given some choices and I think what I'm going to specifically talk about in a very short order <coughs> is what is harm reduction. I'll talk a little bit about reduction versus abstinence and I will also talk about does harm reduction work. Uh, harm reduction is a public health, public policy paradigm. Uh, an ideology, uh, a way of approach to certain diseases. And nowadays the disease we, we talk about is substance abuse. But where it really came into uh, uh, sort of prominence and in the verbiage of the discussions of healthcare was in the late 80s and early 90s with the HIV and AIDS crisis when it was first beginning. During that time, they started to see, you know, uh, for those of us that are old enough, uh, uh, you know, AIDS was uh, essentially a global epidemic in some areas, uh, a pandemic, and in some areas an epidemic. And uh, one of the subgroups of populations that was heavily suffering from this disease was not only the homosexual population, but the drug using population and or the homosexual drug using population. And AIDS was becoming such a problem in the spread of this infectious disease, uh, harm reduction programs started to be implemented in more progressive parts of the world and, uh, and in the U.S., maybe San Francisco, I don't recall at this point. Like I said, I didn't really prepare, so everything's uh, up there in my mind somewhere, but uh, forgive me for a few mistakes. But they started uh, implementing needle exchange programs because it was such a public health emergency issue. And that's where it came into the discussion of public discourse. And it has sort of come back into the discussion of public discourse with the opiate crisis. Now keep in mind, the discussion is not at all new. Uh, uh, but I'm just giving you a sort of a historical evolution uh, how it came into the late 80s, 90s, and late 90s. And that by that time, we really knew what it meant for the issue of opiate abuse or intravenous drug use um, and how it could save lives. Now, what it essentially means, and there's many ways to approach this definition, is that here's what we're going to do. We are going to, let's, let's now move simply to uh, intravenous drug use. Uh, we're going to not approach this disease by addressing the disease primarily, but we are going to approach this disease by addressing all of the secondary issues that cause social discourse, disease, and death. That's it. Our primary focus is not going to be the disease, but we're going to approach the secondary issues that come with the disease, which is other diseases, death, and social dysfunction. So what do I mean by that? And let's just use substance abuse, intravenous drug use. Instead of saying, and uh, and then we'll get into really explaining what this discussion is. You know, uh, uh, instead of saying abstinence, the fact is recognize that abstinence is sort of impossible for most people. And the concern here is to decrease death, disease, and all of the social destruction the psychological dysfunction and destruction and the assault on the human psyche, soul, and body that comes with drug abuse. 
since I cannot get abstinence, I will change, let's use needle exchange as an example of this. I will give him clean needles and the disease progression will continue as it does, but I will keep him alive, decrease infection, decrease hepatitis C, decrease hepatitis B, decrease HIV, and the guy can live another day to fight. Now this comes with a lot of criticisms and I will get into those in a second. Uh, and I have my notes here to remind me of stuff and I'm going to try to keep this short. So far I've basically described what in general the public policy, public health, uh, health and the medical terminology in some senses of what is harm reduction approach to a health issue. It's not new. I'm, I'm not talking about it in terms of a scientific and clinical sense. I'm just talking about this stuff is as old as civilization itself. 4,000 years ago in China, people would walk home from the tavern in a certain city in a certain province, and this is well documented in history. Uh, they would be walking home and be drunk. In the winter, as they were walking by the river, which was a ledge of some sort, they would slip on the ice, fall down an embankment, hit their head or freeze to death and die. And everybody was going to the tavern on a regular basis to drink. The local officials attempted to curb the drinking of alcohol. And their success rate was essentially zero. <laughs> Nobody stopped drinking or not getting drunk and walking home. So these guys are dying, you're losing a life, you're losing a breadwinner, you're losing a human being, you're losing a family member that could bring food to the table. And you know, there's profound humane, social and physical consequences. So they realize they can't curb their drinking, but the right thing to do is minimize the death. So what did they do? They build a fence next to the embankment. That is a perfect example of harm reduction. You can't stop the primary disease at that moment. So you stop the secondary disease process, whether that's social, psychological, physical, and whether it's going to cause more ill or death, let's stop that. In the 50s or 60s, and I think Northern Europe, there was a some campaign because there was a lot of deaths from driving uh, uh, intoxicated uh, and nobody was wearing seatbelt. I don't remember which country, possibly Norway, possibly Sweden. I can't recall it this time. And so an initiative was started to put on seatbelts. And that was against a lot of public uh, um, opposition for a lot of odd reasons. And uh, because they couldn't stop the drinking. What, what, well, what did it do? It saved lives. That is an example of harm reduction. And in fact, individuals exercise harm reduction themselves. A smoker knows 30 cigarettes a day is worse than five cigarettes a day. So he attempts to cut back his smoking. It decreases what's called morbidity and mortality and it has social consequences on his pocketbook. Morbidity and mortality mean disease and death. The drinker might attempt to cut back his alcohol intake. And when he does that, what does that do? Well, if, for example, and we can use extreme examples to really draw out the benefits, what does that do? He drinks a case a day and he comes home and for example, yeah, a regular thing for him is violence to his wife, violence to his children, drunk driving that could cause mayhem, incredible physical consequences on his heart, on his liver, on his blood pressure, on his nervous system, essentially every system you can think of because alcohol is by definition a, 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 a poison. And so if we can get him to go from 24 beers a day to 10 beers a day, you increase death, you increase 
disease and you decrease the social consequences that will actually translate into a lot more death, disease, social dysfunction. That's harm reduction. Now, before we get into the arguments against harm reduction and why it's of such controversy, uh, you know, uh, and it's really become a political issue, uh, let me just be really clear before uh, we move forward. I was saying, hey, these are what I've essentially told you are anecdotal things. Uh, let's move away from that. It's 2019, the 21st century, in the United States of America. We'd like to think we're socially advanced and progressive in our thought and a very humane and thoughtful and caring society. Not having harm reduction, the, the harm reduction model of approach, let's just simply take it for substance abuse, has overwhelming by magnitude orders just beyond orders of magnitude beyond even discussion in terms of clinical evidence, public health policy data, public policy data that it works. Not only does it work in decreasing disease, in decreasing death, and eventually, actually, if you have harm reduction programs, you are actually saving a life so you can actually have contact with the patient and create an opportunity for resolving and addressing the issue of the disease at a later point. And that's how harm reduction ends up working. So there is no debate if you're interested in critical thinking or rational thought versus magical thinking and political discourse, there's no debate that this is the right thing to do if you are interested in human outcome. From a moral or ethical perspective, it's categorical barbaric behavior not to have harm reduction which is the irony of it when a lot of the arguments against it are from socially conservative, uh, morally concerned populations. It's really insane. Uh, uh, I was reviewing some stuff today about the Insight program, <clears throat> which was in Vancouver, which uh, was uh, actually a, uh, a harm reduction clinic, but it was actually... Uh, a place uh, where they can go and it was a safe haven to shoot up heroin. And the way this all came about was that essentially, and this went on from the late 90s to 2016, 17, so forth, and that there was data about it. Uh, but uh, by having a safe shooting gallery, uh, what was declared a state of public emergency in terms of opiate overdose deaths went to this in 2016. We just looked up the data to recall. In 14 years, 75,000 addicts shot up 3 million times across 20 clinics of insight. And the death rate of over, from overdose was zero. Zero. In clinical evidence, having a statistical outcome where the number is zero is unheard of. And every single one of these folks <clears throat> uh, is a human being. Please click on the video on the link to the left if you like what we're talking about. Uh, there's other videos uh, regarding substance abuse. I hope to do a lot more on harm reduction. It's a, a topic that's near and dear to me. And please, below, leave any comments, any questions. I hope to generate a discussion regarding this topic so we can uh, talk about it more in the future. Thank you very much.